So I recently saw a pretty interesting proof of L'Hopital's theorem that I thought I'd make a video about. And I found this in a 1991 issue of the American Mathematical Monthly. So here we've got the version of L'Hopital's rule that we'll prove today. Although you can use this technique to prove the other versions of L'Hopital's rule as well. So let's look at this just to see what we're getting ourselves into. Let's suppose that f and g have continuous first derivatives and the derivative of g is not zero. And then we're also supposing that the limit of f of x as x approaches infinity and g of x as x approaches infinity is zero. And that the limit as x goes to infinity of f prime over g prime is l. And then the result is that the limit as x goes to infinity of f over g is also l. So this is the L'Hopital's rule type 0 over 0. Okay, so we're going to use the precise definition of a limit here, or maybe a limit as x approaches infinity. So I'd like to recall that. So we say the limit as x goes to infinity of f of x is l if for every epsilon bigger than 0, there is an m bigger than zero, so that if x is bigger than m, the absolute value of f of x minus l is less than epsilon. And now I'd like to point out here that this inequality is the same thing as saying that f of x is between l minus epsilon and l plus epsilon. And that's perhaps a little better way of looking at it. We've got this epsilon band around the limit. So I've got this graph here that I'm going to sketch out the situation. So let's create an epsilon band here. Let's say it is about of that width. So that means this point up here would be L plus epsilon and this point down here would be L minus epsilon. And let's put some horizontal lines built off of that band. Okay, so well these are pretty horizontal. Okay, so something like that. And now I'd like to notice that we're outside of the band for the smaller values of x, but if we go far enough, we like totally inside of that band. And how far do we have to go out? Well, in this case, it looks like we need to go out to about right here. So this would be our value of m. So now check it out. For all of the values of x that are larger than this value of m, the value of f of x, which would be like right up here, is most definitely between L minus epsilon and L plus epsilon. It's within that epsilon band of the limit. Okay, so good. We've reviewed this precise definition of the limit, and now we're ready to jump into our proof. Okay, so now jumping into our proof, let's look at this first condition where we have g prime of x is not zero. This is actually not super necessary. What we really need is that g prime of x is not zero after x is maybe large enough. But we might as well shift things around just to take g of x to always be non-zero or for all positive values of x. Anyway, that doesn't really matter. But notice if g prime of x is always non-zero and g has a continuous first derivative, then that means that g is always positive or it's always negative. And so without loss of generality, I'd like to assume that g prime of x is bigger than zero for all x, really after a certain point, but I'll say all x in the real numbers. And I keep saying after a certain point, that's because we're taking the limit as x goes to infinity and all that really matters is for extremely large values of x. Okay, so we've got a positive first derivative for g. And you might say, well, how did we assume that without loss of generality? Well, we could simply replace g with negative g if the derivative were negative, and that would switch it into something positive. Okay, so now we're ready to apply our precise definition of an infinite limit. Okay, so given epsilon bigger than zero, let's observe that we can find a number m which is bigger than zero so that, well, let's see, the precise definition of the limit is applied to this setup, f prime over g prime and l. So in other words, we have f prime of x over g prime of x minus l is less than epsilon, and this is gonna be for all x bigger than m.
Okay, nice. But let's observe that we can multiply that by g prime to clear the denominator, if you will. So that's going to give us the absolute value of f prime of x minus l times g prime of x is less than epsilon times g prime of x. And observe that I took the g prime out of the absolute value. I could do that because we assumed up there that g prime was positive. Okay, so now what I'd like to notice is that we've got some object here, which is just a bunch of derivatives of functions. So it kind of makes sense here to apply an integral. And we're going to apply an integral starting at some t value bigger than m and then going up infinitely large. So in other words, for all t bigger than m, we have the following inequality. So I've got my integral from t up to infinity of the absolute value of f prime of x minus l times g prime of x dx is less than the integral from t up to infinity of epsilon times g prime of x. But now let's observe that this object right here, this integral of an absolute value, is a little bit hard to work with. So what we'd really like is the absolute values to be outside of the integral. But that's in fact just the triangle inequality for integrals. And that pushes the inequality in this direction. So over here, we've got the absolute value of the integral from t to infinity of my f prime of x minus l times g prime of x dx. But now I can kind of forget about what's going on in the middle and then apply the fundamental theorem of calculus to the extreme left and the extreme right of this inequality. So let's see what that's going to give us. So applied to the extreme left, we're going to have, let's see, that's going to be f of x minus l times g of x. And we need to apply that from x equals t to the limit as x is approaching infinity. And that's going to be strictly less than epsilon times g of x where we're evaluating that, again, from x equals t to x approaching infinity. Okay, so now let's observe as x approaches infinity, f and g both approach zero. So all we're gonna be left with is what's happening when we let x equal t. But since that's the lower bound, we're gonna pick up a minus sign inside of that. So that being said, let's jump to that line at the top of the board and finish everything off. Okay, so this is the inequality that we left ourselves with after a very, very small step from the last board. Okay, so now I'd like to make the following observation, and that is that we know that g prime of x is equal to, or sorry, is bigger than zero, and we know that g of x is approaching zero as x is approaching infinity. So let's see, the slope of the tangent is positive. In other words, the function is increasing and its limit is zero. But the only way to be an increasing function whose limit is zero, infinite limit is zero, is to always be negative. So that tells us that g of t is less than zero. And that's for this g of t right there. But if g of t is less than zero, then that means that minus g of t is bigger than zero. And why is this important? Well, let's look at this inequality that we've built and observe that on the right-hand side, we've got this minus g of t. We'd like to divide that by that minus g of t, but dividing by minus g of t, in this case, will not swap the direction of inequality because minus g of t is positive. Okay. So let's divide by that minus g of t. But over here, we can just take its absolute value or recognize that minus g of t is equal to the absolute value of g of t. Actually, let's maybe write that down right in this step. So again, if minus g of t is positive, then minus g of t is the same thing as the absolute value of g of t. Okay, I think that maybe simplifies everything. And now we can simply divide by that absolute value of g of t, and that's going to leave us with the absolute value of f of t over g of t is less, or sorry, minus l is less than epsilon. But check it out. That's exactly where we wanted to end up 
for this limit fact right here to be true. And that's a good place to stop.